Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Namibia, land of the brave. Brave men and women who dedicate their lives to protecting a country of harsh terrain, ancient cultures and vulnerable wildlife. Namibian conservationists Dr. Rudy and Marlies van Vuren are on a mission to travel the length and breadth of Namibia to meet these intrepid individuals and to witness the incredible work they undertake on a daily basis. These are the unsung heroes of Namibian conservation and these are their wild jobs. Like I say, we work on a daily basis with different animal species, from a lion to a baboon to a meerkat, polecat, you name it. Almost all the animals from Noah's Ark. For us, it's important to never stop learning. And in this episode, Malise and I are going to visit some people, especially those that work with endangered species, to see how they do things. One such vulnerable species is the vulture. Namibia is home to the highly endangered Cape vulture, the leopard-faced vulture, white-backed vulture, hooded vulture, and white-headed vulture. Many of these birds are under threat here in Namibia. Today, Rudy and Marlies are taking to the skies themselves and heading to the southern part of the Namib Desert, deep in the Namib Nauklucht Park. Under the scorching Namibian sun, only a few animals find this environment hospitable. Rudy and Marlies are here to meet vulture expert Peter Bridgeford to find out more about the vulture's plight. What, what are their natural enemies and what, what's really um, endangering them? They've got few natural enemies in the wild other animals. Occasionally the birds of prey will take a very small chick if it's unguarded. But that, that's in a minority. Your biggest threat is still human beings yeah. using poison. Farmers resort to poison and uh, vultures are a secondary target. Uh, he's not targeting, he's in, actually he's not even targeting the vultures. In places now, there's a lot of cheetahs. I hear farmers have trouble with, with, with catching stock and things like that. Yeah, we hear that too. You hear it a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> but today, you can go into any, any shop. You can buy, you can buy poison 200 drums if you want to. The vulture comes along, eats the, the dead hyena or the dead uh, jackal, it gets poisoned. Yeah. And so you can get five, six hundred vultures coming down. There's a big lot of meat. They're all very happy. The vultures and you're killing you know the vultures they just the whole area is strewn of dead vultures hanging in the trees meet 100 meters away kilometers away you'll find dead vultures yeah. today peter has a very important task and needs rudy and molly's help he has spotted a young leopard-faced vulture chick in a nest the plan is to tag the bird for research purposes vulture chicks are often left alone in the nest for long periods of time while their mothers collect food the height of the nests ensures the coolest possible temperatures in an otherwise sweltering environment. Peter must work quickly to avoid causing stress to the young bird. Peter, so why are we ringing this bird? First of all, to identify that individual bird. It's got a ring on, and each, each bird has got an individual ring with a different number on. Uh, so that first identifies the bird. The tag is to draw attention. Okay. There's a lot of information you can get from, from uh, knowing where this bird goes. And that's our, our appeal to farmers always. If you see a bird on your property or you're going to Itosha and you photograph it, let me know. Because I can't go to Itosha every week and go and look for, for marked birds there. Yeah. And I really would appreciate if the farmers could phone me and think that because we want to know where these vultures go. So literally how can they get involved? How can they contribute? They can contribute by first of all reporting it or, and if you've got vultures on the farm, 
Look after your vultures. Yeah. If you've got a dead cow or a dead horse, put it out for them, always in the same place. The vultures will get used to feeding there. Have a place where they can drink water. Um, and look after your vultures on the farms. And many, many farmers do. What, what we've seen with cheetahs and leopards, when, when we collar them and we involve landowners or farmers mm -hmm. in that whole uh, process, it's a much better thing, or it's a much easier thing to do. And it's the same thing with the vultures. Yeah. You know, some of these guys phone us, hey, when are you coming to look? We've got, you know, and, and you go to the farm and they'll know exactly where the nests are. Yeah. And that's always for me a good sign when people do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and people want to be involved. You don't want to just be, a, 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 you know, hear about these things. Mm -hmm. You want to be involved in the thing and that, that makes a big difference. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for a great experience. Yeah. No, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Marlies, will you put him back in the nest? Yes, yes. Yeah, all right, take you. him. You know how to, I've showed you how. Okay, <laughs> okay. you go put him away. With the chick having been successfully tagged, Marlies carefully returns it to the safety of the nest. Holy cow, this is The nest? Yeah. Thankfully, people like Peter and his organization, Vultures Namibia, are doing everything they can to ensure the survival of these impressive birds of prey. Not all of Namibia is sun-baked desert. As we head north, the landscapes grow ever greener. Here, some astounding people are looking after one of the world's most endangered species, the African rhino. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Rudy and Marlies are in the northern part of Namibia, home to the vulnerable white rhino and the endangered black rhino, to meet the researchers and the fearless men who guard these magnificent creatures. Abby, we, we as Namibians, we've always worried that the problem in South Africa uh, might come over to Namibia. And uh, I know for a fact that in 2014, around a thousand rhinos have been posted in South Africa. What's happening in Namibia? What's the current situation? Yeah, sadly, it's, it, poaching has started in Namibia. I mean, we sort of knew that it was going to eventually creep over the borders. Um, so yeah, sadly, it, it has started. And 2014, I think we've seen just over 20 rhino poached in Namibia. In your opinion, what's the w single most important thing that can happen that you think will stop poaching? In order to stop poaching or to even reduce it, we are going to need to tackle the, the end user, the market for rhino horn. The main fight is not here. It's not on the, on the ground. It's not in Africa. It's in China. It's in Vietnam. We need to get the message through somehow, by whatever means, that rhino horn isn't worth anything. You know, we need to get that message across. That's the only way. Marlies and Rudy are heading out with an anti-poaching unit, or APU. This APU's role is not only to protect the endangered rhinos from poachers, but their knowledge of rhino behavior and tracking skills are invaluable to Abby's research. Suddenly, two white rhinos are spotted deep in the bush. And it's, it's wonderful. We were tracking these rhinos and finally we've, we've got a sighting. But why do you want to see them? What's the reason behind that? We want to make sure that a, they're all okay and they're in good condition. Um, and we, we need all the data for a lot of the research. Um, and also our sort of anti-poaching strategies. We need to know where the rhinos are, how many we have, um, you know, sexes, calves. So at each sighting, we try to get as much information as we can. Tell me, is it a, a cow and a, and a baby? Yes, yeah, that was a cow and a calf combination. And how old is that little calf? Probably almost a year now. Okay. Yeah. This is an amazing experience. Thank you so much. How long have you been doing this job? I think it was just nine years. Nine years? 
Mm. Can can we swap jobs? I wouldn't want to take your job and you do my job because <laughs> I think this is tremendous uh, work that you do. Uh, you know, we were looking at the tracks and I could I couldn't see anything. How do you see the tracks? Explain to us. Yeah, but you can see if you can. You know, this one is my foot. You can see. Yeah, now I can. Yeah, see. you can see. Yes, yeah. I can. Yeah. <laughs> No, I can't see. You cannot see. Oh. But if you can... If you go down, you see. If you can, then you're going to see, oh, this one is a track. Then you can follow. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Not the white, the white one. She has a, a strip. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the black... It's not... It's it, it a strip, but it's not many, but... It's like this one. This one is... It's a black one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's obvious. Yeah. It's <laughs> Kuna, it's obvious. And now we know. <laughs> you see, we will not make the anti-poaching unit. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's but many facets to to rhino conservation. People sitting in offices, tracking on satellite maps, um, people negotiating what to do for rhinos, that kind of thing. But these are the guys. Uh, that really does the hard work. They're at the front line and risk their lives every day. Uh, Kapuna, and, and we think you are a hero. In our country, you are one of the heroes. And you guys must keep doing it. And great job. No problem. Thank you very much. Ciao, ciao. As the APU carry on with their unrelenting task of safeguarding the rhinos, Rudy and Marlies want to find out more about the research involved in rhino conservation. So how, what's a day look like in your life? No such thing as an average day, but um, generally there'll be an interaction with the APU, which is getting the data that they've collected in the field. Often there'll be um, a section for lab work where I've processed the samples we've collected. There's a lot of analysis work that goes into conservation and management sort of decisions to be made from that. Busy day. Every day. No time for a donut. <laughs> no. <laughs> Abby has a rather smelly task ahead of her collecting scat samples to take back to the lab for the vital genetic research of rhinos. Abby, when, when we take samples for our DNA uh, from cheetahs and leopards at Nankuse, we take hair. Um, how do you go about collecting your DNA samples? Ideally for the rhino work we use um, tissue samples, so tissue samples that we collect from the ear notching process. Um, if that's not available, we have done some work with um, dung collection and, and dung sampling. Um, it works not as well in the white rhino, so we normally only use it as a backup for the black rhino work. And from here you take it to the lab? Yes. This high-tech approach to research can only ensure the survival of a species teetering on the brink of extinction. With the research you've been doing here, has there ever been any huge surprises? I think the biggest surprise that we had after our initial parentage study was that the, the main breeding bull was not the main breeding bull, <laughs> in the sense that we had two bulls um, and we thought one was the dominant one and the other one was always on the periphery. Um, and the dominant one was definitely not the father of the majority of the calves. And uh, Abby, the, this um, genetic study and the conclusions that you make from it, um, how does that help you in the management of the rhinos? Exactly in a situation like that. So now, whereas there we are just, because we actually sold that bull um, just through the normal sort of practices that you would do. You would observe, you'd see the dominant bull, you would assume that he was the main breeder and you would remove him after X number of years. Um, and now when we did the DNA testing, we actually saw that we didn't need to remove him at all. In fact, we should have removed the other bull who'd sired most of the calves. So in exactly in a situation like that, now you can test, you can see which bull has really de you know, successfully bred the most and then remove them or him. Yeah. Especially with your numbers going so low and becoming an endangered species. Yes. It's nice to, in yeah. small populations, to be able to say who is who and yeah, mitigate it. Yeah, that's exactly, that's a perfect example. So if you have lots of small populations, especially in a country like Namibia, mm -hmm. it's really nice. You've got these isolated populations which can't, you know, naturally migrate between each other yeah. so that you can actually select the correct animals to mm -hmm. move. Because moving, you know, a rhino is expensive, it's dangerous to the animal, it's, 
you know, it's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you can actually select the correct individuals beforehand and make sure that you're making the correct moves. So the take home message is, uh, you can look like a breeding bull, but look at the genes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the genes. It's all in the genes. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. The Ford, Rudy and Molly sleep in the luscious green landscapes of the north. Local gyrocopter pilot, Stuart, has agreed to take them above the treetops. However, there is only room for one. Who's going? Let's play for it. Ching chong chong. One, two, three. Yeah, he's going. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, come on. One, two, three. Okay, you go. <laughs> okay, bye. bye. <laughs> May the force be with you. Zing. <laughs> This part of Namibia is home to a wide variety of incredible wildlife. And thanks to the people who have dedicated their lives to these amazing animals, there is hope that it will be for years to come. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. The Nankuse Wildlife Sanctuary has a diverse number of animal orphans who have found refuge on this reserve. It also provides a safe haven to another of Namibia's endangered species, the African Painted Dog otherwise known as the wild dog. Due to their excellent hunting abilities, these dogs are often persecuted by farmers in a bid to protect their livestock. However, some have found a place of safety at Nankuse, like a young female dog, Lady, and her male canine companion, Liska. We've got two dogs here in the back, two wild dogs. One is a 10-year-old male and one is an 11-month-old female. They both come from the north of Namibia and they make a very beautiful couple, one old one and very, one very young one. So they're happy in the new camp. The plan is to um, sedate her and then put in a microchip under her skin. Because the law in Namibia requires us to identify every animal um, that we keep in captivity. Stop. Age before beauty. Go. 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 Using his trusty dart gun, Rudy must get close to the dogs in order to sedate Lady. Go. Go. Not the easiest of tasks. With Lady sleeping soundly, Rudy inserts the microchip and the couple retreat to a safe distance to monitor the situation. I've raised a few puppies in my lifetime and it's one of the most amazing animals. They have personality from the day they're born. You can smell them for kilometers. They smell like stinky feet and rotten meat. They are amazing animals with just beautiful personalities, always positive and energetic. Wild dogs is probably one of the most endangered species, not only in Africa, but also in Namibia. We estimate their numbers to be less than 600 here in Namibia. There's several factors that contribute to their critically endangered status. There's no tourism value to them on the one side, because Tourists can't see them in Itosha or in Sosasvlei or 
places where tourists go, there's no hunting value to them because hunters don't usually hunt them for trophies. And then thirdly, there's no farming value to them because farmers can't tolerate them. Therefore, we need to market uh, wild dogs as a critically endangered species. People need to know how critically endangered they are. Time to act is now. We must allow the magnificent African painted dog to remain proudly visible in Namibia's untouched landscapes and not fade into a distant memory. Coming up in next week's episode of Wild Jobs Namibia, Rudy and Marlies meet Francois, a snake specialist. Okay, so they're not poisonous? They're not venomous at all. That is a relief. And have some rather close calls of a slithery kind. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager.